My name is Melissa Bondar, and I've been a stage and production manager for the last 18 years where I've done a lot of work in risk assessing performance. So that is what I would like to open our symposium chatting with you all a bit about today. Um, if we get to the end of this and you only remember three things, here's what I hope they are. Disability is more common than you realize. There's a noted disconnect between aesthetic goals and access realities that doesn't need to exist. And micro event breakdowns could be a useful framework to help pinpoint and overcome that disconnect in participatory events. So when we look to creating better risk practices, I think we think about things like the emergency exit I just asked you to be aware of. Um, but in reality, especially with participatory and immersive events, they can really sort of skew into the realm of questions about what you're asking the audience participant to do. Do they need to sit? Do they need to run? Do they need to lay down? And if they can't, as a performer, what is your plan for that moment? A significant number of participatory events that I've personally encountered really love to involve the use of hands. I'm assuming that a lot of like practitioners assume that that's a really quick and safe way to uh, develop some intimacy with the people that they're engaging with. Um, but let me tell you that plan falters when they reach out for their, my hands thinking that I'm going to reach out for theirs and we both learn in that moment, I have a limb difference and you don't have a plan. So now I'm really, oh, can you not hear me? Yeah. Get a little bit closer to the mic. <laughs> cool, hybrid events are awesome, but we're so excited to have you guys with us. <laughs> for those of you out there watching the weirdness of me talking into a mic, thank you for rolling with us. Um, so in these situations, most of the time, the performer just plows on and we are both super uncomfortable until we get to the end of it. And I'm just guessing here, but I don't think that's usually what they're going for artistically. It's plowed into too intimate of a depth, too intimate of a depth in that moment with no real connection. Conversely, a few performers have stopped and been asked for consent or just acknowledged my hand in the littlest ways and put me immediately at ease that they knew what, what they were touching and it was not surprising to either of us. And we were able to actually achieve the intimate moment that they were hoping for probably in a deeper depth than they would have initially assumed because honestly, not that many people touch my hand. Within disability culture, there's a move towards person first language. So for example, a person who is blind versus a blind person. And this exists to put the emphasis on the person before the disability. When engaging in scholarly research at the intersection of theater and disability, I find it interesting how it's labeled disability theater because I think a lot of times it puts the disability before the theater. For me, it's an apt reflection of how logistical needs take primacy over aesthetic needs when the two worlds often collide. One in seven adults is likely to be disabled during their working life. And among those disabled, 84.7% are only mildly disabled. And a lot of those disabilities are invisible disabilities. So while audience scholarship has increased quite a bit in the last century, this research doesn't often focus on the experiences of people with disabilities. And this is unfortunate because a lot of accommodation considerations share a lot of the objectives that we have in immersive and participatory experiences. When you're sorting accessibility considerations, the focus moves more onto the spectator and how the spectator is interacting in the performance, as well as how the spectator is interacting with other spectators in it. So this presentation aims to introduce the idea of micro event breakdowns as a tool for both risk and aesthetic assessments. And this tool then becomes a useful way to develop better accessibility practices. This presentation will also touch on the idea that rather than heaping a lot of accommodation ideas into a single micro event, some micro events might do better as a parallel option to achieve their full accessible potential. So micro event is an analysis of participatory events divided into smaller sections of the performance. George Ramos, who coined the term, described them as a quadrangular relationship at any given time in the event between four key elements, the guest role, the host role, the use of the physical space and the fictional moment or context it represents. This notes the important players, the performer and the audience participant, the space and the narrative context and how they interrelate. So breaking down every aspect of a performance into micro events from the moment the audience participants enter the performance space until their exit allows for more specific needs assessments, both in terms of risk and inclusivity. And as I mentioned when I started, the first thing that comes to mind regarding risk assessments are the concrete logistical factors. But Adam Allstead adds another layer to the discussion regarding risk when he talks about the psychometric paradigm which still emphasizes these technical and physical considerations, but it also makes space for the social and psychological needs. When engaging with the audience on such an intimate level in participatory theater, risk assessments need to expand beyond the practical and into these emotional and ethical considerations. The breakdown of a performance to micro events helps clarify these needs that arise at each step of the performance, especially when you get into the realm of more ambiguous ethical or emotional triggers. 
than merely looking at the performance from a meta view. A benefit to the flexibility of a lot of immersive and participatory theater is that there's room for improvisation and personalized experiences, which can create a fertile aesthetic ground amid the parallel tracks for inclusivity. And due to competing accommodations, accessibility needs may conflict from one to another, and it may be impossible to accommodate everyone. But risk assessing each micro event really brings you to look asking, who does this leave out? And developing that sort of mindset as you move forward with your practice. The key here is not to neglect the artistic considerations while you are trying to figure out the logistical needs as well. Um, Bree Headley, who is a really great uh, scholar in the disability field, notes in their article, uh, the majority of accessibility work is considered only on a logistical level and not at the level of aesthetic, symbolic, or social access. So a likely limitation, honestly, to the concept of micro parallel micro events is time and money. Um, that's all of our limitations to everything in the arts, right? So to develop alternatives with the same depth of immersion and fully rehearsed scenes takes additional rehearsal space, time, and possibly additional performers and crew. However, taking the time to budget and work around this can really help avoid these ad hoc solutions that people with disabilities so often encounter. Additionally, if these costs are associated um, with certain accessibility options, an effective measure you can implement to uh, deal with them is to ask about accessibility needs on your ticketing website. This allows production companies the option to schedule only when certain needs are necessary, um, as well as pushing divisors into a thought pattern that allows for more streamlined aesthetic integration. Because instead of knowing, you know, on June 3rd, we have to do the deaf performance, you never know when a deaf performer might arise. So you have to be prepared all the time and you have to be ready to integrate uh, the different needs, uh, accessibility needs uh, more fluidly than if you just have to get through one performance and figure out how to do just enough to get by in that day. Um, a really good example of these parallel tracks comes from Talking Birds and their production of Solid Blue at a medieval monastery. Um, before sharing that, though, I would like to say that I found this example very quickly in my research and was real excited. So I went to go look for a second example. And I spent months looking for a second example and could not find one anywhere. So while I'm sure some other companies have come up with parallel examples of inclusion, um, they are not well documented. And it's definitely a lot harder to reinvent the wheel every time than to just go to the tire store. So I think there's um, a lot of room for uh, better documentation of these examples for people to access. But back to the talking birds and their show, The Solid Blue at the Medieval Monastery. The lift was broken beyond repair and it was too expensive to fix for their run. So that made part of their production accessible to people with mobility impairments. Um, the company devised an alternative option though where they were able to broadcast the key points of the show that were happening into another room that was still set dressed as part of the show. And they had three performers actually come in and wrote a special segment that in integrated a live performance as well into the experience that those with mobility impairments were experiencing for the show. And this, I think this illustrates how the goal for parallel track should really be just different, not less. Um, connecting back to my own lived experience again, I recently saw a really brilliant performance of Bottom of the Ocean, but an entire segment of it revolved around redemption and absolution after a fairly intense previous encounter that had me confessing some surprising levels of things, I thought, um, this redemption totally failed because when the performer went to absolve me by washing my hands of the things I had just confessed, um, when I stuck them out, she froze, just grabbed my left hand, and we both had the really a very strange and awkward moment where she sort of wiped that down and we both just looked at each other for a second and I felt very not absolved besides uncomfortable as well. Um, for this performance, this could have actually been super easily avoided at check-in because if everyone was aware of what the micro events for the show were and the fact that one whole room revolves around getting your hands washed for redemption, it would have been really easy for the person at check-in to just go give that performer a heads up, um, which probably would have helped us navigate that moment a lot better. Is it likely that we can accommodate all people for all performances? Probably not. So that might leave you asking, what's the point? But raising awareness is always a key first step to creating change. And personally, I don't accept, expect a fully accessible world overnight, but I do think there are a lot of performance companies and makers who can benefit from developing better tools for more accessible performances. Not only does this tick a doing right thing box, looking at the world through a variety of ways expands the lived experience for everyone. Bruce Barton in his interview on the PII Network in a discussion about the pros and cons of trying to create work in more accessible ways, says even if, if something you add onto it, you know that only two out of 100 will have the sensibility or the condition to experience it. In some ways, I think it enriches the work. The expression I often use is it increases the viscosity. It's thicker, it's denser, there's more going into it. So in conclusion, 
Further study is needed to test and develop this theory that the application of micro events to participatory performances can develop better risk assessments that take aesthetic quality and accessibility into better consideration. And now that we've come to the end, I'm just gonna remind you of my three key takeaways. Disability is more common than you realize. There's often a disconnect between aesthetic goals and access realities that doesn't need to exist. And further study into how we might apply micro event breakdowns could prove a useful framework to help pinpoint and overcome this disconnect in participatory events. Thank you. As like one of the organizers, I'm not super sure how we're doing on time at this moment, but if anyone has a question yeah, or two, good. we could probably. Three minutes, so yeah. three minutes awesome. If no one has any questions, we can also just move on to the next. Out there in digital land. Oh, Louise. Um, how is it? Oh, it's up to you. I can hear you. Okay. Um, you said about when you were getting your hands to some of the performances that it was quite a shock to the person who was and yourself. And I um so in case you came here and sat there louise is asking um i was mentioning how it was a shock for the performer when i reached out my hands to them um and she was asking if i find it's always a shock or if, if it's something that i'm adapted to and most of the time i am i'm totally adapted to it i actually find that in participatory theater is one of the few times where i I expect it in a way because I mentioned how hands are a big thing there too. But in the moment it happens always, I'm like, oh, I was looking, I was trying in my head to navigate your show to know where it would be. So I could put us both at ease and I missed it this time. And now here we are. Um, yeah. And in that particular performance, if you ever go see it, you're put in this big robe too. So your hands are just hidden. The whole this woman had no shot. And I also did not know this was what was coming. So she was especially, she was like, give me your hand. She like pushed it because I kind I just gave her my left hand the first time and I was like, go. <laughs> um, so no, like most of the time, I feel very comfortable navigating. But I also think the majority of times in life, you're not trying to forge an intimate connection in the moment. And that's really a primary thing in that in that moment in the performance where, you know, if we go to shake the whole world, shake hands. So my first greeting with most of the world is pretty weird to begin with. So I'm very not shocked the majority of the time. Um, but yeah, in this case, it was both of us just awkward. I think it's when they are shocked, it also reflects back on you because now you're uncomfortable too. And that sort of emphasizes uh, even more. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just asked um, that while well, I said, I don't think everything is likely to be fully accessible. Essentially, how could we get closer to that? Um, well, I think more awareness. Also, I think in some ways we think some things are more difficult than they are. So workshops and lectures and talks about how easy some accessible moves can be, I think will go miles towards getting people to think that way. I think also developing a company-wide mindset of inclusion instead of thinking what you can't do, thinking what you could and trying to find the barriers in advance because a lot of times we just don't even consider the disabled community when we're building things. Um, and also more money arts council, if you ever see this, more money. But um, that's the key to a lot of things, I think. Uh, money and time, as I mentioned, are two of the biggest things that are likely to slow you down. Um, but even if your company made a commitment to doing this and you sort of just tackled one version of expanded accessibility every time, you would then have the vocabulary and the knowledge moving forward that it wouldn't take as much effort next time. And if you keep doing that over time, you'll have a very, very accessible company, probably within a few performances. And also the people who work for you will then be more fluid and, and knowledgeable about how to interact and how to integrate those skills, even 
like as I mentioned, what, uh, what Bruce Barton said, I think I expanded the whole group of things. us joining us digitally, I'm going to sum this up not nearly as eloquently, <laughs> is that it seems like ethics play quite a key factor into this and should be considered more fully. And also we should consider our relationships to institution scale and our ideas of art as a whole. <laughs> but yours was much better, sorry all, that we didn't have the mic. <laughs> <laughs> 